Well, good morning, everyone. This is uh, demystifying, demystifying, servo sizing, <laughs> demystifying, demystifying. Uh, we're we're excited you're here. Uh, this is something that uh, that Sixto and I have been working together on for a long time. Um, we have a couple of goals for this. Obviously, we we just really want this to be a, an educational next uh, forty five minutes or so for you. But honestly, we also want it to be entertaining for you as well. So we um, we want to encourage you to ask questions via the chat. Uh, and then uh, also, you know, again, if you have anything that you're curious about or anything we don't talk about afterwards, please give us that feedback after the fact. Let's do it. Um, Start it off. Yeah. So first all right. of all, introductions. Uh, I'm Michael Petrini. I'm a senior sales engineer with the Escala Motion. My territory that I cover is uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And my name is Sixto Morales. I uh, lead up the Southwest Territory for Escala. I'm the senior regional motion engineer as well as the international sales manager. And uh, again, we're happy that you're here. Hello, neighbor. Howdy. So let's start off with the purpose of why you're here. So the purpose of this webinar is to provide tribal knowledge of how to size servo motors for the various typical applications that are out there. And the process that we'll follow through is going to be reviewing some common mistakes, right? Yeah. Common mistakes. We've got some common servo applications that we'll go through as well. A, the importance of gearbox selecting when you need one and then follow it up with a, a live sizing demonstration. So yeah. we'll, we'll be able to take into a good, do some good software yeah, stuff this here. Should, should be pretty practical stuff. Should yeah. be. Uh, in the end, you will have a, a you know, payoff. Why, you know, what's, what's the end here? So you'll have an understanding of why servo sizing concepts are important and you'll be able to make a, a really good investment comparison. Um, so I know you guys have keyboards, you're on your, uh, your laptop and so forth. So um, you know, let's take a look and see, do you have any of these type of applications in your plant? Maybe there's some uh, bottling applications or labeling. Maybe you've got some R&D going on, on the side, little 3D printing or just gantry stuff going on. Maybe there's some uh, tensioning or spindle applications that you want to look at. Mm -hmm. Starting to get a little complex, maybe a little rotary knife application, some camming. This particular one is a, a, a slitter or a sheeter machine doing some cardboard. And let's get real complex. Let's start looking at a, adding a bunch of pulleys in there for the uh, mechanism. And let's get big. Let's go to maybe a linear actuator, you know, maybe do some hexapods, uh, doing some forward and inverse kinematics. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you guys have a, a keyboard. Maybe you type in the chat window. We'll uh, let you type in there and kind of look at it as we go along here. Yeah, if you were hoping to just be able to sit back and kind of not participate, this is not that kind of webinar. No. We're, no. we're expecting you to interact with us a little bit. Let's do it. Yeah. So. A webinar would not be complete with just a little bit of uh, sales marketing here. So we're going to do that here. Just one slide. A manufacturer of, uh, as it says, of excellence, but we're a manufacturer of servo axes. We've got a, a lot of EFDs, a lot of robots in the field. Uh, we're over 100 uh, years old. We uh, we serve in 25 countries with Yaskawa Sales, and we're a large company of over 14,000 employees, and um, we're a $4 billion Global sales, four billion, four billion in global wow. sales. So that's our one marketing, uh, one marketing slide. Hey, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Mr. Petrini here. We'll review some common mistakes. You want to take it over from here? So when Sixto and I were talking about what we wanted to t discuss with you about uh, servo sizing, we realized really quickly that sometimes it, it makes a little bit more sense to talk about the pitfalls and some of the things that we've fallen into over the years that we've we've committed ourselves as we've sized servos. Um, and, and quite frankly, we just thought that seemed like a really interesting place to start. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to go through a couple of the common mistakes and how to avoid them when sizing servos. The first mistake that we see a lot is when people compare AC induction motors with servo motors. Wait a minute, what? Yeah. What? yeah. So it, it, it's pretty easy to see why, right? You know, you've got an AC motor, you're used to horsepower. AC motors are identified by horsepower. They'll have a voltage and a current that'll be right on the nameplate. You'll be able to see all those things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, an AC induction motor will need a variable frequency drive or some sort of starter to get it moving, whether it's a soft start or, you know, whether it's just an off the line switch even. Uh, they are current driven, uh, but they do not have internal feedback. Uh, there's no solid precision to them uh, in general. And you're also not going to get torque control. Mm. But on the other side, they yeah. do represent a smaller investment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can go buy an electric motor from, frankly, probably even a hardware store if you look hard enough and get it installed and plugged into your piece of equipment and working usually within the same day. We have them out there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A servo motor, on the other hand, will be identified by kilowatt. And on that nameplate, you're also going to see 
a torque usually, and also a um, also a uh, what am I trying to say? Speed. Thank Speed, you. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Good yep. job, Sixto. You're welcome. <laughs> so you're going to see uh, you're going to see a kilowatt rating. You're also going to see a speed in RPM or uh, meters per second if it's linear, and then also a uh, torque reading. Uh, a servo motor is going to need a servo amplifier to drive it, uh, and it will also feature internal feedback, giving you that precision. Uh, and then also, well, it's also I should slow. say it, it is a larger investment. So, so again, most folks between programming and things like that, it's going to be a, a little bit more time to get that servo motor up and running. Yeah. But uh, again, though, I mean, horsepower is horsepower. Call it a kilowatt if you want. A horsepower at 746 watts and a kilowatt at a thousand watts, it's still watts, right? So I should be able to just take an AC motor and compare it to a servo, right? Six you probably should, yeah. I think well, you should take another sip of your red hey, X cup there. I think someone gave me this cup on purpose. <sighs> yeah. Family Feud, one X. Yeah. Not good. Don't don't do this. Um, and and here's why. I'll, we'll we'll talk about it here. So, we all know Ohm's law, uh, which is p equals e times i, or, or as I like to call it, pi p equals i times e. Always about the food, <laughs> or pizza. <laughs> So any motor, whether it's an AC motor or a uh, or a servo motor, is going to take that electrical energy and convert it to rotational. That's that's the same. But what what really is different here is lies in the internals. So I want to draw your attention to the rotor of a of a AC motor, but then also the wound stator. So a rotor is just going to have a uh, an armature tied to that shaft, and once we energize the coils in that wound stator, it's going to start chasing after that magnetic field, trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. Now it'll never actually fully synchronize with that magnetic field as it rotates around, um, and and that is called slip. By There's the way, the slip, yeah, yeah, and that's slip. So the the smaller the slip percentage, the more efficient the motor is. But again, you're never going to have a truly uh, synchronous um, uh, movement as you uh, as you're chasing after the that wound stator. I also want to note if you if you notice here, you're going to see that there's going to be a lot of frankly air inside that inside that motor. You're going to see air between the shaft and the and the wound stator. You're going to see some air between the coils. There's there's a lot of again there's a lot of space in all that. Mm -hmm. uh, on the flip side, an AC, a servo motor is going to be a little bit different. Again, it's still going to convert that electrical energy into rotational motion, which is what we talked about. But herein lies the difference. A servo motor is going to give you that feedback for the speed, the torque in newton meters, and then also the position. And how do we do that? Well, there's a couple differences here that we didn't talk about before. But basically, this, uh, this shaft is going to have a rotor on it with an actual permanent magnet motor inside of it. And remind me, six to oh. two. Whose magnets do we use again? Well, what not we use it? They are neodymium iron. Oh, right, right, magnets. right. Yes. The construction, yeah. yeah the thank you. Magnet. Yep. Say that one more time because I interrupted you. Neodymium iron boron magnets. It's a good final Jeopardy question for when Aaron Rodgers is hosting again. It should be. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll notice that rotor's going to have a huge chunk of that permanent magnet just right on top of it. And then also that wound stator is going to be a little bit different as well. You can see that the copper windings are packed much more tightly in that stator. There's not nearly the air gap that what we saw before. So we're going to be able to have that synchronous motion. And then now here's the secret to the feedback. No. Every servo motor is going to have an encoder on the back. Without this, it's not actually a true servo because by definition, a servo motor needs an encoder. But this encoder is what's going to give us that speed, that position, and that torque feedback back to that amplifier. So Rota put in the stator, and you got a what motor you got over there? Uh, this is a six uh, six hundred watt seven A's. Yeah, it's a six hundred watt. This is a seven hundred fifty watt. Check wow, out. difference in the length. Mine's shorter and fatter, I guess, with the uh, size here. And it, you can't, you probably can't tell by me holding this because I work out a lot. But this is actually pretty heavy. <laughs> There's a lot of copper in this. A lot in there, man. A lot in there. All right, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Go ahead. No, it's cool. Please, go ahead. All right, well, what about a linear servo motor? Uh, well, we were talk yeah, we were talking about this earlier. Yeah, a so bit. a linear servo motor, and this is a great picture of a Sigma track, too, where it kind of combines a lot of technologies. Imagine, if, we, if you will, if we were to just basically split the stator in half and then just lay it flat. That's mm -hmm. basically what a linear motor is going to do. We're going to have a, mag a magnet way on the bottom and then a moving coil on the top. We're going to have speed feedback position feedback and also force, but instead of it being in terms of rotational, 
it's now going to be linear. So meters per second instead of uh, RPMs. And then the force is just going to be newtons instead of newton meters. Again, because we're not acting around a circle now. Now we're just going straight back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's important to note yeah, the moving coil there is uh, what's going to be doing the, the moving. And mm -hmm. then the magnetic weight kind of stays stationary. Yeah. And as far as I know, I could be wrong here. And if I am, feel free to uh, mention something in the chat window about my ignorance. But I've never heard of a linear AC motor. Nothing comes to mind there. <laughs> You're on a roll here. Virginia. Yeah, yeah. All right, mistake. All right, number, so that's mistake number one. That's mistake so number one. You don't want to confuse AC induction motor with a with a servo motor. Yep. Okay, I yep. get it. So Some good things to to note there. Right, I like it. Right. So the next one is ignoring uh, inertia, the inertia ratio. So you heard me say a minute ago on the nameplate. For a servo motor, you're going to have a torque rating and a speed rating. So it's intuitively, you might say, well, I know I need this much torque. I need this much speed. If I get this motor right here with the torque and speed that I need, I'm good. Right? Dude, I'm, it's golden, right? Yeah, it's gold. Good. Problem. You're about to take another. Oh, am I going to take another? Oh, dun, 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 dun. Second one, it's like Family Feud in real life. Well, we're going to have to pay royalties for that. Now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I probably shouldn't say that. It's like a generic game show that you've never heard of that uses X's. Generic game show, yes. Anyway. So, yeah, don't fall into this trap either. Uh, again, what is inertia anyway? Hey, well, what you going to tell us? I, yeah, I am. <laughs> so, inertia is merely a, the force that it requires to get something moving once it's stopped and then also stop it once it's already moving. Mm, That's okay. it. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward when you think about it. Uh, I like it. But let's uh, let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, let's say that you're sitting at the stands at Wimbledon, and one of those players just kind of lobs a tennis ball into the stands. Um, there's going to be like 50 people that will try to get that tennis ball, and just about any one of them would probably be able to catch it, control it, and then also keep it away from everyone else trying to get yeah, it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. Pretty easy. Even Sixto could catch a tennis ball if I were to toss it to him. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if I were to lob a bowling ball at Sixto, now come on. Come on. It would probably take a lot more effort for him to not only catch that ball because he's got arms that make him look like Gumby, but it would also probably be a lot harder for him to, to control it to a stop. It's a sport code that you, uh, you, it can't, does. you can't see the guns. Okay, okay go ahead. Yep. <laughs> so it's really important that you have a servo that's actually that has enough inertia to be able to maintain and control that load as well that, in that same way. I would agree. But, but by the same token, it also doesn't make sense to have a gigantic servo that has, you know, a ton of inertia just for the sake of a small, a, a small load or a small inertia as well. So what am I trying to say? It's important to match the inertia between the two, right? Yeah. Because it, it wouldn't make sense if, if you were running a logistics company, it wouldn't make sense for you to send a, you know, 18 wheeler with a huge tractor trailer just to carry one bale of hay, right? That's not efficient, but also it takes so much more power just to move that truck. That bale of hay doesn't really matter. Unless you're making multiple runs. For the case of the example, can we just... All right, fine, we'll do just one. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. We, we practiced this. We did, we practiced it, gosh, yeah. a lot. Should be okay. So, taking that one step deeper, what is the, we'll talk about this, uh, this concept of the moment of inertia ratio. And this is merely just the inertia of the load divided by the inertia of the motor. Any, uh, any servo is going to have on, on the, the nameplate, or I shouldn't say on the nameplate, sometimes they will. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it'll be on the nameplate, but it'll definitely be on the data sheet. You'll have a, a published inertia figure uh, giving, you, giving you the idea of how much inertia is uh, tied with that servo motor. Now, to determine the inertia of the load, that takes a little bit more effort, but luckily our servo sizing software can actually help you with that as well. Don't give it away, but yes. It should be noted, by the way, that um, the typical industry standard allows for a 10 to 1 inertia mismatch uh, where or inertia ratio where you can have 10 times the inertia of the load uh, and it still be controlled by the motor. We can actually go up a lot higher than that because of our, uh, our tuning algorithms and our software. I believe we're up to what is it 40 to 1 now? It's 40 to 1. Oh my gosh. 40. 40 to 1. I mean, Crazy. I'm turning 40 in like three years, but you know, <laughs> 40 to 1. Yeah, you, you never know. Too All much. right, so that's mistake number Too two. Much. Okay, so mistake number two is ignoring the inertia ratio. It's not enough for just speed and torque, but you got to also know the inertia ratio and what you're, what you're, what you're rotating or moving. Okay. Yeah, you got to, you got to know what it takes to start and stop that load. Right? Okay. Gotcha. Right. So that's the inertia. Good. What's the, the third mistake is what we call the manufacturer crossover trap. Mm -hmm. 
This mm-hmm. happens to us a lot. Uh, I would I would argue I probably get this more than than any of the other ones combined. But well, what's this? Well, takes their scenario. What, yeah. What do you mean? I mean, we've mm-hmm. you've gotten this phone call before, right? It's you know, hello, hi, it's me. Yep, yep. It's uh, it's good to talk to you too, Six Show. Um, I need your help. This machine that we have, it's it's not terribly reliable. It's got some servos in it that are way obsolete that no one knows anything about anymore. Um, can you just rip this old stuff out and replace it with something new from your Scala? Uh, well, I mean, it just kind of makes sense, right? Like we should be able to do that. Just match the torque, match the speed, match the inertia. Inertia. And you should be good to go, right? Yeah. Do I need to get this out again? Is it the red X again? Yeah. Red X. Yeah. It's three. Three in a row. Three in a row. Yeah. Okay. Don't don't do this. Uh, don't don't uh, take the time. Go through the exercise of sizing appropriately, and then you'll find yourself in a much better position. So why doesn't this work? Uh, there's a few reasons. First of all, all servo motors are not the same. So remember, we just talked about this. This is a 600 watt servo motor. This is a three watt servo. Oh, sorry. This is a three watt <laughs> motor. This is a 750 watt motor. Yeah. This is a small motor, actually. Not even, not even close to the same size. Intuitively, you might even assume that this one would be the more powerful motor, but that's not the that's not the case. But it's really this one, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> that, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> So servo motors are not in- interchangeable. You'll notice that even even the mounting on this is not even close to the same as this one. And these are both in the same servo family. These are both A servo motors. Uh, so uh, seven A servo. It's a G. It's a G. Or it's a J. I'm sorry. It's a J. It's a J. It's a J. Okay. They're both made by the same manufacturer, and they have a different uh, <laughs> different mounting. So again, you're going to have physical size limitations. Things are going to be different as far as that goes. Yep. Also. There's a difference in rated speed and torque. So again, some folks may may uh, put a different number uh, for their rated speed and torque. Some folks may say, "Oh, our give out a max torque number versus an RMS torque number." At Yaskawa, we give out both a max torque and an RMS torque, so you can look and compare both and size appropriately. Uh, again, you also want to factor in the inertia of the motor because again, not all not all those are going to be the same. So. We talked about three different mistakes. I'm going to pass it back over to Sixto to show you the right way to do things as far as sizing goes in the context of some great servo examples. For but first, let's look at some common servo applications, shall we? All right, so I'll take it over. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. So the first one uh, is kind of a typical one is a ball screw, right? And typically, ball screws are in gantries. So gantries are something like this. You've got a machine that's out there. And if we go with the example that Michael was talking mm-hmm. about, Parts are obsolete. Like there's limited people who can actually work on this machine. It's up and up and running retrofit. So where do you begin? Well, first begin by just asking some generic questions, but we're gonna go through these is what is the load? And Michael, I think you have something to touch on this, don't you? Yeah, yeah. So when I was first started sizing servo motors a long time time ago, um, someone told me a, a couple really great uh you know, just units and, and conversions just to memorize. Um, the first one is, is uh, inches to millimeters. So for every one inch is equal to 25.4 millimeters. Yeah. That's just a good thing to know uh, because a lot of data sheets, especially for uh, as many suppliers as there are, they're all international. They're going to give you units in millimeters. So just know that that uh, that uh, 25.4 millimeters are in one inch. Uh, and then the other thing too is is that the density of the steel is 7.86 grams per centimeters cubed. Why does this one matter? Well, this one's probably a little bit more practical, but let's say that a, something like this, like what you're seeing on, on screen right now, a customer will say, hey, can you can we retrofit this? And then your first thing is gonna say, okay, well, great. How much does it weigh? What's it's the load? load? Right. And they'll look at you like, I have no idea. Dude, I don't know, it's big, it's, you know, it's a big load. Yeah, well now if you uh, if you look at it, uh, you can you know take a couple measurements. And now if you know the density of the steel, you can extrapolate from there and determine roughly what that load probably weighs. Very good. Mm-hmm. I like it. So okay. 25.4 millimeters in one inch, 7.86 grams per cubic centimeters. Well, First, tends good. to do steel. Sounds like a pop quiz later, maybe. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So the next question that you want to ask is the orientation. What? How is this machine going to be moving? Is it going to be horizontal? In this one, in this particular example, it is horizontal, but it could be vertical. It could also be on an incline, like 40, 45 degrees or 30 degrees. Just depends on how, what the application was doing. Mm-hmm. The other question to ask is, what is the speed? So what speeds are we trying to move here? And typically what we want to do is we want to size for the worst case scenario. Yeah. And I know this is the one question, this is the one answer that you probably don't want to give is, 
Well, it's not going that, it's not very slow or, uh, or it's going very slow or it's going very fast rather because those don't really tell us much. It's good to have units to your speeds. Mm -hmm. For the worst case, let's say an e-stop gets hit and pressed, you wanna be able to know that my machine will decelerate within a certain amount of milliseconds um, just so it's not catastrophic, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't want anything to happen there. So typically you want your, your speeds, they're gonna be in inches per second, feet per minute, uh, millimeters per second, but just some number so so that we know, we start to build a profile, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, with with any of these questions that we're kind of proposing here, it's important to really you know nail down a, a firm idea. And if your customer doesn't really know, you can always kind of bracket it and kind of give some limitations to try to get a little bit better information. But yeah, you want to get a unit for just about everything we're talking about right. here. The next question to ask is, well, how far does this axis travel? Because you got to know the typically where, where it's going to go. And again, don't say just this much. Mm -hmm. You got to have some sort of unit so we can have to, to go with that motion profile. The other question to ask is if there's any required precision. It, what is the required precision? Can it be within X amount of inches? Uh, can it be within X amount of millimeters? Some applications, quarter of an inch is, man, it's, it's good, better than what we had before. Mm -hmm. Some applications, no, we got to get into the submicron. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's down there. And of course, this also brings up the good point too about you know precision is accuracy versus precision. You know, so oh yeah, tell us about that. So yeah, you know, you, you'll hear people talk about repeatability too. They're really talking about precision at that point. When you're talking about accuracy, you're you're actually talking about uh, you know how close it is to the true mark where you actually want it to go. Yeah. Uh, in this case of servo motion, where and then precision and repeatability, you're actually talking about how uh, how tightly you want it to go back to the same place over and over and over again. Uh, again, in our case, typically speaking, those two are going to be married together. If, if you have one, you're, you're, you should be able to have the other. Um, but when you're talking um, about, you know, about their hertz hangups, et cetera, with, with what they have currently, it's probably a good point to mention, you know, okay, are you having a, a precision problem or are you having an accuracy problem? Right. Again, because then it, it just gives you a better, uh, a better uh, plan on which way you need to go when you're presenting a solution. Good definition, Petrini. Like Thank it. you. Thank yeah, you. Very good. Couple of last questions you want to ask is what environment will these axes be in? Is it going to be indoor? Is it going to be outdoor? A little mix of both? Is there a heater? Mm -hmm. Is there a cooler? Something. So we want to be sure to, to size for that appropriate. I mean, yeah, and, and again, we talk about weather a whole lot there too, but that doesn't necessarily just mean weather. We'll get into more details on this later. But again, you know, you think about even what happened this year in Texas, we had extreme temperatures, you know. Where Blizzard it's, getting, know, yeah, yeah, it's it's going, it's getting over a hundred, and then we have you know four days of so stuff. we have four degrees, yeah, for the next week, yeah, crazy. So so again, it's important to plan for that kind of stuff, which doesn't happen really, by the way, mm -mm. but it did, but it did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now the last question you want to ask is, hey, what's the duty cycle? So is this thing going to be on for uh, one shift? Maybe it's eight hours for a whole day, or maybe maybe it's twenty four hours, or twenty four seven. Mm -hmm. Maybe you got to do it for three shifts, and then within that shift. You know, it's going to be it's going to be going for at least a solid good, you know, six hours or so. Right. There's going to be a percentage to there. The percentage of the time that it's on versus when it's off. So, yeah, another question to ask there. OK, so we looked at two just kind of axes, if we will. Now we're getting to maybe a full machine here. So this is called the vertical form fill and seal machine. What questions do you think I'm going to ask? Oh, gosh, let's I start would with the load, probably right? start with the load. Yeah, okay, with let's the load. start with the load. OK, so what is the load now in this case? A little different, but you're going to have some tension that there's going to be these two axes are going to kind of push together and kind of form, if you will, the pull the film down or this uh, material down. Um, so there's some sort of tension that you have there. So that is really your your load in that sense. Mm -hmm. It can be in pounds or newton meters. Obviously, when we look at this one, it is going to be a vertical orientation. Doesn't necessarily mean that all the other axes are going to be vertical, but just in particular, this one here. What is the speed? This application was running somewhere around 330 feet per minute, which if you translate all that, it comes out to 66 inches per second. The worst case tra travel for this was a four inch move. So those bags were being brought out by four inches. Uh, another part of the machine here, but it's a, kind of the back portion of it. But uh, what is the required precision? If there's, you know, these, these are probably in the, in the millimeters mm -hmm. that you have to get into because you've got those registration marks on, right. on a lot of uh, product. The environment is going to be in an indoor facility. So you yeah, want that, to mention something about yeah, some that? Yeah, so that brings up an interesting point, too. We talked about environment. We talked about weather here just a minute ago. But again, if you're indoor, now now there's a whole lot of other questions you could ask, too, about the indoor facility, especially when it comes to food. We, <laughs> no X, sorry. No red X. <laughs> so, so 
again, when you're talking about food, are we at a place where, you know, is the motor going to be in a spot where it's in a washdown environment would be a good question. So, yeah. you know, are, are, are we are we planning on spraying down everything with, you know, hot caustic chemicals every single night or a couple times a day or whatever? Um, hopefully are, not the cabinet. Yeah, hopefully not the cabinet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a very good point. Are we at a point where we can shroud that motor to protect it from that? Again, maybe just the actuator needs to get washed down, but maybe the motor can be back. I mean, again, these are good questions that, that you want to know answers to when you're sizing because it will it will dramatically change uh, your approach. Mm -hmm. That's good. Lastly, what is the duty cycle? How often does this machine need to be operating? There's a good number to, to find out here. Mm -hmm. Same machine, just a different axis, axis if you will. Or portion of the machine is a, is a film pool. These questions, they're, they're you know you, they're they're getting kind of the same because it's each axis is is, is the same sort of thing. It's going to be there's a load somewhere. The mm -hmm. or, the orientation for this particular one is more of a horizontal. Um, now the speed, well there's the speed at the motor, but you'll notice that there is a gearing ratio going on here. So you've got your bottom driver pulley, if you will, from the servo motor, which looks to be like somewhere around two two and a half inches mm -hmm. diameter. It could be two inches. But then it gets to a much bigger uh, gear out there. So that's about maybe a five inch diameter, five and a half inch. So there's going to be some gearing going on there, which is good to account for. Yeah. Travel. Again, this was a four inch pull product machine. Uh, the required precision is going to fall with the same because the all axis is going to be working kind of in unison. So you want to be able to account for the precision for that. The environment we touched on was yeah. an indoor environment. And the duty cycle was... If it's going to be a, an eight-hour shift, or it's you know one hundred percent, ninety percent, seventy percent, that sort of thing. Yeah, and you know you bring up an interesting point too when you talk about duty cycle too. That could be something as simple as like, okay, it's it's going to move you know this far, it's going to turn this much, then it's going to stay and dwell for a while, right. and then maybe thirty seconds later it's going to return home, or ten minutes later it's going to return home. Again, probably not with a vertical form fill and seal. That's probably going to move pretty fast. But again, you know when you talk about duty cycle, don't limit yourself to just, okay, I'm going to work eight hours a day or I'm going to work, you know, 12 hours a day and that's it. Get get a little bit more information on realistically what that move will look like because, again, that'll help you size the servos too. It shall. It mm -hmm. shall, yeah. Uh, let's get kind of large here. Some mm -hmm. large presses, some press machines where you've got uh, material that's going to be fed into a rotary die of some sort or a rotary stamp and uh you, know, you want to make sure we get they get pretty large uh, so you've got some maxis at the bottom there that can be uh, kind of synchronized all together yeah i like the uh, i like for the weld slag just to give you an idea of how big this press really is mm -hmm. yeah it's a good uh, good reference there huh uh hey let's go with uh plasma cutter plasma cutter so five axis system some of these uh, of course these are going to use some x and x prime axes sometimes on the opposite side it is going to be an idle or mm -hmm. an idler kind of where it's just riding along, but it's good to know if you are going to have two axes, one on next and next prime, that you can um, size appropriately for that. Yeah, I've been guilty of this before. When I was when I first started, uh, actually, frankly, even when I hadn't first started, I used to always think that when you have a gantry with an X and X prime, it makes sense just to say, okay, my total load is, you know, let's call it 100 pounds. Thousand. Let's go 1,000. 1,000 pounds, right? Let's, uh, say, thousand, let's thousand. say it's 1,000 pounds. It's a big machine. Yeah. yeah. You know, small stuff. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> big machine. So say it's a thousand pounds. Okay. Well, each motor needs to handle a five hundred pound load. Well, realistically, that's that's probably not the best way to do this. And, and we are getting into a little bit more of the tribal knowledge here, which, from to me, recall from the purpose, process, and payoff, we were we said we were going to do that. So, so when you look at a when you look at a shared load like this, you also have to keep in mind there's going to be times when that gantry is going to be all the way in the back with that uh, Z and Y axis all the way in one corner, yeah. and then you might have to make a move where you're basically going all the way to the opposite corner just as uh, just as quickly as you would any of the other moves. Um, so in that point, you know, you are going to see a much higher load on one side of that gantry than the other. It probably makes more sense to go, you know, 75%, maybe even 80, up to 85% of that load on those X and X prime motors. Uh, then that way, you know, that you have uh, all the, all the, you know, torque and all the speed that you need to get that job done. And just like that, he's still on my thunder. That's okay. <laughs> so let's talk about the Y axis first, before we get to what he just said. You've got a bridge, so you've got this axis that you're going to have to do some sizing for. And then, yes, let's look at that Z-axis. Yeah, because as Michael said, the load isn't going to necessarily be cut in half all the time. This load that you've got here for the Z-axis has to carry 
a let's call it a torch let's call it a cable chart a, a cable track let's call it the uh, the cables that are going on in there aluminum extrusion the housing if there's any sort of heat sink or whatever's on there so it's mm -hmm. going to be moved to one side so that motor on the right hand side is going to have to take not all the load but 85 yeah. 85 percent 90 percent of that load so it's good to to size for that appropriately yeah and let's not forget I love these. These are good. Hand sketches, baby. Hand sketches are good because they're free flowing. You right? You can you can draw out what you need. Maybe some uh, new designs. Maybe it's a, the same design that you have already mm -hmm. that you want to size for and retrofit. But let's not negate the hand sketches. I can't tell you how many times I've I've been on a call with this guy, and we're talking about a sizing application with a customer, and I'm way off. So I'm a visual. I like the visual yeah. stuff. So yeah. I was drawing a 20 inch shaft. And he's like, no, no, no. We don't need that. We need we don't even need a shaft. It's like maybe an inch. Oh, okay. Well then, let's. Yeah, this this will definitely that. help you understand the physics of it, right? The physics right. of the application, understanding where all the forces are. My my very first boss, the same guy who taught me all about the the uh, conversions to memorize, would would always tell you get in the habit of of drawing of drawing a hand sketch. And and frankly, I, I would argue that at this point, if there's if we're meeting in a conference room or something like that, and there's a dry erase board somewhere, I'm probably going to stand up and start writing on it. <laughs> you already have. <laughs> let's move on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, it's your turn. So we're going to turn it over to Michael here to discuss some gearboxes. Gearboxes, yeah. So, so this is a this is another um, this is another important topic because uh, again, we're going to show you some really great tricks here on how to save money when you're sizing servos. So, uh, why why are gearboxes ne necessary? Well, gearboxes accomplish three things, and and we'll get into a fourth in a minute. But three primary things: uh, one, they're going to decrease the output speed of your motor. They're going to increase the output torque, and it's going to help you reduce the motor size. That's where it comes into the, the saving money aspect. Uh, so, so if you're sizing and you know you put everything together and you find yourself needing just a gigantic motor, uh, but you're running really, really slow uh, as far as your output goes, this may be a really good uh, spot to apply a gearbox uh, in general. So, um, also, you know. Sixto mentioned some marketing earlier. I wanted to let you know, Yaskawa actually has gear motors in stock uh, and with virtually any uh, any ratio you could want. Uh, mm -hmm. So so again, when that time comes, just remember to think of us. Um, but I also wanna to mention too, that not every application needs a gearbox. Uh, maybe you've got something where, uh, you know, a direct drive works really, really well. On some ball screw applications, the ball screw itself actually creates a, a gearing effect in a way. Um, so, so again, you know, it, it may be a situation where, where you know, the speed and the torque line up really well, and just one motor by itself fits fits the bill really well. So, sixty percent of the time, it every works time. every time. <laughs> every time. <laughs> Thank you, Will Ferrell. You're welcome. <laughs> and Paul Rudd. <laughs> yeah. All right. The last thing that a gearbox does, and this actually is is kind of an interesting, uh, you know. I would, I would call it kind of a, a, a sub point uh, is it actually will reduce the reflective inertia back to the motor. So again, we talked about this idea of we can get to 40 to one uh, inertia mismatch, but the, the industry is pretty standard at about 10 to one. Mm -hmm. um, when you apply a gearbox, it'll actually reduce the reflective inertia by the square of the ratio of the gearbox. So if you've got a five to one gearbox, for example, now that motor is going to see one twenty fifth of the inertia from that load that it would see normally. Mm -hmm. This is a great way to help uh, deal with that uh, with the inertia mismatch problem as well. So so again, applying a gearbox does a whole lot more than just uh, reducing speed and increasing torque. It can actually help you reduce your inertia as well. It looks pretty too. Oh, so another tribal note. Mm. Uh, one thing that's worth mentioning is when you, uh, you when you're sizing gearboxes, they're actually set up in stages, and depending on uh, depending on how much uh, of a reduction you need, you may end up needing more than one set of, of gears in that gearbox. And again, those those uh, sets of gears are called stages. Um, so typically speaking, anything between you know a two to one or a five to one or a ten to one. Those are all going to be in a single stage. So I usually tell people, if you can, try to size it with a 10 to 1 gearbox. It'll help you maximize the use of that gearbox. It'll give you a good ratio, and it'll help balance the uh, the cost between the motor and the gearbox. I like that. Good balance. So where oh. can we go for more, Sixto? Oh, yeah. So let's talk about some video links here. So our website, yaskawa.com. You can find some, a lot of in-depth training. Uh, follow this trail with me if you don't mind. We uh, will go over to the support and training section. You just kind of hover over here. Don't click yet. Just hover over the support and training. It'll pull up a little training tab here which says e-learning curriculum. Uh, that one you click on. 
Mm. Click on that one. And then hover over to the Servo and Motion sub-tab or subheading, and then click on the Servo and Motion e-learning curriculum. We're almost done, I promise. <laughs> the next thing is look at the subtopic. Specifically, if you just want to do sizing, you can look at sizing videos that we have here. Got a, a lot of good videos as well that uh, that go through uh, in, in more detail than what we're going through here. We're right. just kind of skimming the surface. So the core, you know, you've got your sizing basics part one and part two, as well as, I know we're gonna do a live demonstration, but you've got some videos here to uh, revert back to when you're doing actual sizing of mechanisms. And uh, there's probably more to come. Oh yeah, say. yeah, we're always adding to, to this. To get our Sigma Select sizing software, which I'm kind of busting the bubble here already, but if you go back to yaskawa.com, hover over products, hover over motion, and find the Sigma 7 software tools. You'll click on that guy, and it will open up another uh, window for the Sigma Select software. Hey, did you know this was a... Uh, no cost to download, right? No cost to download. Nice. It's, it's great. It's good stuff. And it's updated regularly, which is nice, too. So as new products come available, we update the software so you can buy into it. Yep. Uh, let's also not forget that, uh, hey, search Yaskawa America for on uh, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. We are also on Twitter and uh, follow us on those. And also we're on YouTube. And if you wouldn't mind, if you if you, there was a button down there for liking, just, you know, just go ahead and smash that like <laughs> button. <laughs> we, uh, we appreciate it for you. Smash that America. like button, click subscribe. Click subscribe <laughs> to be notified of all new. No, seriously, hey, we have a lot of videos. Yeah, There's a ton do. of videos on there. It's, it's good it's stuff great. for sizing, for, for most it's for product as well. So it's it's a... You know, it packs incredibly point. thorough and in any, in, yeah, to your point, you know, from all the way to the basics, kind of like what we talked about today to, to you know, applying very specific features uh, uh, from our servos. Uh, yeah. Great, great place to start. Okay, so let's go. Uh, hey, let's do a little live demonstration. Yeah. So we're just going to run through really quickly on a little bit of a live demonstration. Do is size and axis which is gonna be a 3D printer. So this particular ball screw we have here is uh, 200, it's, the whole bit is about 200 millimeters uh, by 200 by 250. Uh, the payload is gonna be 30 pounds, is what we're gonna use here for our sizing, mm -hmm. because you have, maybe you have one of these at home and you, you're like, these are steppers, let's switch over to servos, which hey, we haven't we talked do. about the difference between steppers and servos yet, but maybe that's another one. Another video, yeah, maybe, next month. Maybe we'll see. See how this one goes. Orientation is, go is going to be horizontal. You're going to have uh, speeds at 60 millimeters a second. That's what that's what published. So as long as we can do 60 millimeters a second, we're good. Your distance is 200 millimeters, which is probably the whole entire ball screw there. Probably the entire but, guy. So it's going to be travel, shorter yeah. than that, but we'll go with it. We'll go with it. Uh, indoor environment is going to sit on your desktop. You've got a duty cycle 85%, and some specs on the ball screw uh, that we have there. So. I think at this point we'll uh, we'll switch over to the sizing portion of it, Perfect. and we'll. Uh, so when you go to Yaskawa's website and you download Sigma Select, this is what will be downloaded to your to your um, PC. When you open up, I always suggest you file, save as, make a new uh, make a new um, file here. We're going to leave it untitled, but hey, it works. We'll do just fine. You can put in a lot of the company information here: your name, the project title. If there are any application notes, uh, pulleys, uh, sprockets, uh, links, belts, payloads, all the questions mm -hmm. we went through, you could put in here as uh, as notes for later. You click on the load editor tab. Now here's where we're gonna have a bunch of the mechanisms that you can choose from. You can either choose them from the left-hand side as the mechanism to change it, or you've got a drop down, make it nice and simple, or you can click on you know roll feeder, if you will. Um, in this case, we are going to stick with a false screw. Now we mentioned the, do you remember the pounds that we use this for the load mass? Oh, I already forgot it, 60? 30. 30. That's good, good number, we'll cut in half here. So we're gonna type in a 30. Uh, we're gonna look at, oh, friction of coefficient. Uh, we're gonna look at the mechanism. Let's just use ball bearings on uh, on a ball screw here. So we'll just, we'll just accept that number. You could change uh, to different types of bearings here, but we will just accept for this particular one. Getting down to, ah, the lead. lead. Hey, Michael, you wanna tell us what's, uh, yeah, lead so, pitch? so yeah, it's a good good question. So it's funny in the picture there we show ball screw and then we show pitch and inertia, but then in the mechanism we ask for the lead. So <laughs> so remember there's a difference between the lead and pitch. Lead is how far does the ball nut travel uh, in one revolution? 
pitch is merely the, the distance between the two threads. So if you have one, you can usually find the other, but it also makes sense to ask the question, you know, some ball screws are gonna have, you know, two starts, so they're gonna have, you know, their pitch is gonna be really, really tight. So again, you just have to make sure that you're you're speaking the same language when you're talking to, uh, or when you're talking to your customers or when you're looking at your machine on the floor. So, so again, we wanna know the lead, not the pitch. Mm -hmm. Ball screw inertia. So sometimes if you have the manufacturer's specs, they will give mm -hmm. you this inertia number. Mm -hmm. You can input it here by changing what, what units they're gonna be in. Or if you know roughly what it is, you can you can create your own ball screw inertia. You can change the name component, the new component here to ball screw, uh, whatever the machine is. We'll look at the height. So we did say it was 200 millimeters in length. In this case, it'd be the height. Mm -hmm. There is no inner diameter, but there was an outer diameter. Remember that? Oh. It was 12.5, 12.5 millimeters. And the user spec, oh, we got down to your 7.86, 7.86, huh? We're going to select stainless steel here. You can choose aluminum for the various different applications, but we'll, we'll stick with uh, stainless steel. And we'll say accept. There you can see that the total inertia was created, and uh, there is the inertia of the ball screw that we're going to be moving. We account for the load mass. One thing we didn't touch on, and this inclination that's on the bottom here, right now it's set to zero, and that just means it's gonna be horizontal. If you wanted to change this to a vertical application, then we would type in a 90 here, and once you tab over, you'll find that there's another column that comes out that starts to, to ask you about counterweight, if need be, for the, uh, for the particular axis. Uh, in the case of that vertical form fill and seal machine, you would see that you would need to add thrust in the descending mm -hmm. portion of it. So we're gonna stick with zero for now. Uh, let's go to our profile editor. Now it's always good to have a forward and a reverse move. So in this case, what we'll do is we're gonna do just a quick trapezoid. Uh, that move, uh, the units down here at the bottom, we'll switch it over to uh, millimeters per second. And we knew that the velocity of that, uh, that axis that we had there was 60 millimeters per second and the distance that we wanted to travel was gonna be at 200 mm -hmm. millimeters, right? Give or take. Now, for this trapezoid move, it cuts everything in third, third, third. Uh, 1.6 seconds acceleration time is a little too long to be accelerating, but maybe on the mechanism, you might need that. Yeah. You, know, you can always put that in differently, but we're gonna we're gonna say, no, nah, let's get up to speed in a quarter of a second. You know, and the same thing for the deceleration, let's make it that we wanna get down to speed in a quarter of a millisecond as well. A uh, quarter of a uh, quarter of a second. Quarter of a second. Sorry, <laughs> pretty fast. Uh, let's add a little dwell, maybe a second second dwell here. So we'll put in a one, and then remember, follow it up with always a a reverse. This really comes in handy when you're doing a vertical application mm -hmm. because it will account for gravity and your. Um, I can't type and talk at the same time. <laughs> uh, it will account for gravity, but also if there's any regen that is needed or uh, on the application. And we'll so change this guy. Topic here. for another day on regen, by the way. Cool. Topic for another day. That's right. Oh, did I not put in this here? Here, there you go. Sure. And we'll change this to quarter. Same thing here. All right. Lastly, is another dwell, just in case, just to make that nice and beautiful. So there you have it. There is a motion profile. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to also check your motor speed, you can click on some of these tabs, and it'll make the chart a little bit bigger. It uh, if you want to take away the position and just focus on the velocity, you can do that also. We'll leave it like this for now. Now we come to a tab called for motor results. And green is good, yellow's eh, call one of us. Yeah. Red is no, something's missing. You, you can't do this. Uh, we're gonna look at just Sigma 7 motors and we'll see what does it take to just move this axis for, uh, for the small one here. So we'll uncheck the torque factor of safety. We want to look at, uh, what, a J motor? It was a small, that's right. the style of, of motor that I have here. But uh, we want to look at just the J's. So we can actually go in and filter. So Sigma 7 is the leading series for your Skywa servo motors. Let's just filter for the J's. And we'll look at uh, 200, eh, 200 watt motor. So you'll notice that green is good, like we were saying. What the difference is here for the factor of safety is what's rated on the motor versus what you need for the application. Mm -hmm. And that's how that goes for all the rest of them here. But hey, Let's take a look at the inertia. Are we good? We're good. I think we're good. We made sure the inertia is okay. So we got enough motor uh, for the load. Tab over to the motor details section. Here you'll see the motor rating, uh, what the motor selected as compared to the application. You can select multiples too by holding the control tab back on the motor results. For this one, we're just gonna continue on with one. 
Your green section here is your continuous region. You've got your yellow section that is the peak. So the RMS uh, yellow box, you wanna make sure that stays in the green and then your peak values can go in, the red box can go into the yellow. We're not really tapping out this motor at all. Mm -mm, so it's good that we're, we're going through this just to kind of see that, hey, we could actually bring it down a little bit lower or we could increase our velocity um, yeah. and no, for the motion profile. No need for a gearbox in this example. No need for a gearbox in this example. So everything works well. Mm -hmm. It's important to also note that this red peak value could be in the yellow. Uh, Yaskawa gives out a minimum like 300% mm -hmm. rated of a peak torque. So you, you, have, uh, you can be in there for about three seconds, three and a half seconds on some applications. Last tab is a regen, and we didn't touch on this, but basically there's no regen in this application. However, in a vertical type of application, there might have been. The mm -hmm. equations are here for us to kind of go through and just look at to, or to confirm that there is no regen. In this case, you are done. I mean, you can save this file. You can create what's called a PDF file here, and, uh, and it'll save all of your data that you can have, that you can present to your customer, your client, uh, distributor, so forth. So it's got about six pages worth of some good some good data here. Maybe even your boss, if you're uh, implementing the system at work, say you need to justify the budget or whatever, it's a great spot to put it. Maybe so. All yeah. right, let's get back to this guy here. Yeah, so kind of uh, to wrap things up a little bit here. Yep. Uh, so we first of all we talked about the uh, we talked about the purpose process payoff. We talked about the common mistakes comparing an AC motor to a servo. We talked about ignoring inertia. And we talked about the manufacturer crossover trap. We also touched on some common servo applications. Yep. And then I handed it back to you. Talked you about gearbox that. selection. Yep. Gearbox selection. And we wrapped it up with a, a live demonstration. So, oh, who do you call for help? Mm, lots of people. You can call, start with your local distribution or integrator. Uh, you can always call us. We love to mm -hmm. talk. I love to talk. You like to talk? My number is 1 800 Yaskawa. 1 800 Yaskawa. And so is six toes. We'll show our stuff here in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. 1-800-YASKAWA. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Again, you are? I'm Michael Petrini. And my name is Sixto Morales. And if you, have, point, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. We've got a few minutes left. We'll see what, uh, which ones we can get through. And rest assured, if we don't, uh, if we don't answer your questions because we don't know, um, <laughs> no, we'll try to get through as many as we can. And if, uh, if we don't get to your question, we'll, uh, we'll reach out to you offline. All right, we got a nice job, guys. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Wow, lots of people saying some nice things to us. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, we can't repeat that out loud. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> okay, so there's a question here. How do you give feedback about the torque of the motor? I'm clear that the encoder gives us the information about position and velocity, but can it be used to determine the torque? Yeah, so we're measuring the current at the back. Mm -hmm. back of the motor there so that the uh, the feedback gives us the uh the ability to do that but we also we're measuring the the current back at the motor so a good software to use for that is so called sigma win plus version 7 mouthful but we can use that to uh to look at uh, at the torque that's going to be in back of the motor we can always reach out and uh and talk a little bit more of that oh good point scott uh high speed rail is basically a linear ac motor that's that's very true i i didn't think about that there but yeah I like a yeah I actually wrote on one of those one time. So yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. You want to take that one? Is there... I mean, the answer is yes, you could. I mean, so uh, yeah, sorry. I guess I should repeat the question out loud. So yes. can, can a servo motor have the same power as an AC induction motor? Yeah, the answer is yes. You know, if, again, a kilowatt is a thousand watts of so one horsepower is 746. So if you do the math, you could come up with one that would give you that same power output. Uh, but the trick is with, when you look at servo motors is we care a whole lot more, especially when we're sizing, about torque and speed than just a uh, horsepower or kilowatt alone. Uh, if I have an induction motor and I want to change for a servo motor, could the induction motor be as a reference for the servo motor? For example, I have an induction motor, one horsepower, four pole. May I purpose a servo motor? Uh, I think that's a good one. So like the, mm -hmm. the first one we're looking at with the, the one horsepower, we could, but that's kind of a starting point. You still yeah. want to look at what is the load? Where are we? What are we moving? And account for any inertia because again maybe the horsepower the, the one horsepower motor may have been oversized just to give some safe room there and then you oversize that again you, you, you're 
stair stepping being oversized multiple for the times. Multiple and, and by times. the way, we didn't talk about this, but yeah, that's another good reason why you don't want to fall into the manufacturer crossover trap. Yes, in that case, I would use an AC motor maybe as like my uh, as my you know my check check my answers at the very end once I'm done sizing if everything kind of looks right there. Yeah, got a, uh, a ping here from forty to one mismatch. Tell us how we can't. <laughs> Proprietary, it's uh, proprietary stuff in, inside the, well, actually it's, so actually we can't say this because it is published. Mm -hmm. So the the algorithms that we have that are that are baked into the server pack, uh, coupled with, you know, I don't know if we mentioned, but the feedback on this, the resolution is uh, over 16 million pulses at the back of the mm -hmm. motor. So okay. in the back here, you've got the 16 million, uh, you've got an encoder, an absolute encoder that uh, has over 16 million pulses. And so we're able to couple that with the bandwidth that we have on the Sigma 7 servo packs or amplifiers, and you're able to get a lot of good, good feedback uh, from that as well. Yeah, Vibration there's suppression, uh, notch filters, anti-resonance. Yeah, yeah, there's a couple questions here that are kind of similar, an RMS versus peak, and then holding torque as part of a duty cycle. So uh, with Yaskawa, we, we published two uh, torque numbers, a rated torque number and a peak torque number. Our peak torque number we can maintain for, do we say three and a half seconds? Three and a half, it can be up to three, three and a half seconds, yes. Yeah, yeah, and then our RMS torque number can be can be maintained all day long, every day, without any need to cool off the motor. So if you are if you have a gantry system, for example, um, or I'm sorry, if you have a holding torque application as part of the duty cycle, you could actually hold torque without a problem there all day, every day, assuming that you keep it below that rated number. Once you exceed that rated number and go into that peak number, then you have to allow for that servo motor to cool off uh, frequently, basically. Yeah. Can we enter our own motor data for use in sizing systems in Sigma Select? Sounds like a new feature. Mm -hmm. Well, motor data, uh, that would be kind of like, uh, yeah. So Sigma Select is, uh, I guess we should mention this, so Yaskawa's servo pack and servo motors, they are matched set. So when we publish our catalog, technical supplement, anything you see out that's published, it's been tested and tried and it's true. So Yuskawa is very, very diligent in quality. Um, when it comes out of the box, it's plug and play and it works. So for, for the sizing software, it is a, uh, it is a matched set. So um, you can use your you know, data for the load, but the motor data itself can't be put into Sigma Select today. Doesn't mean we can't do it later, maybe. We'll see. We'll get together, you know? Yeah. Pass it out. Figure it out. Dinner. I don't know. Do something. Alpha inertia difference. Why is the alpha inertia different for various motors? You want to take that one? Yeah. So what we're really trying to say there, and I think I'm understanding this correct this question correctly, but the question is why is allowable inertia different for different uh, motors? And we're talking about across different manufacturers. So so someone may have a, an inertia mismatch that may be you know X and ours may be Y, right? And one of the reasons why we're able to get to you know these really high inertia mismatches again is because we do offer the match set of the amplifier and the servo uh, motor itself. Um, so, and again, you know, depending on your application, that may that may or may not matter to you. Uh, but I think that's probably the short answer to that question and why they're different to uh, various uh, ratings for allowable inertia. Right. Some really good questions in here, guys. So thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much for the for the uh, for these questions that we have here. Mm -hmm. uh, and are we coming up on the uh, four minutes here? Yeah, we're, yeah, so we're coming up on minutes. four minutes. We may have to uh, take a lot of these questions offline. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, that is you a great wanna, one. Want to take that one? Yeah, yeah. So the question we have question, here yeah. is, uh, <laughs> and we just start talking. We we like it, right? Question here is. Uh, uh, in what case would you prefer to use a linear servo motor as opposed to a rotary servo motor coupled to a ball screw? Uh, there's, frankly, there's there's lots of there's lots of different variables here that can make one desirable or another. Um, for one thing, um, I may use a linear motor if uh, well, I should say I would use a linear motor if I could if I had a really sound mechanical system that was already addressed with rails and things like that, like kind of like our kind of like our Sigma track too. Mm -hmm. If I had something like that, that, that just, that took care of dealing with all of the compliance issues or something, I might use a linear uh, application there, uh, a linear linear motor there. If I don't, and I and I have a, a, a lot of uh, details from a mechanical standpoint that may be up in the air at that point, I might start with a rotary servo motor and then see if the linear servo application makes a little bit more sense. Um, 
again, it's kind of preference. I know too, another thing to keep in mind too, is that ball screw availability can go all over the place as, as far as lead times goes. Mm -hmm. um, so that may be another reason why it may warrant you looking at a different technology than utilizing a ball screw. Uh, so again, there's there's lots of different, uh, I, I guess I could just summarize and say there's more than one way to skin a cat in that case. Uh, there's just a lot of different ways to approach a, a unique uh, a unique application that way. Mm -hmm. That's good job. Another question here is, does the inertia ratio depend on the motor inertia? Uh, like a bigger motor inertia would give me a small inertia ratio or something? E yes, so each of the motors have their own, you know, they're gonna have their own inertia built into the motor itself, just you know, by definition there. But it is important to couple that correctly to the load. So if I'm moving, you know, in the case that Michael was talking about the bowling ball, if, I, if he threw that at me and took, it took, took a lot for me to hold that bowling ball, at the same token, though, uh, if he threw me a you know three quarter inch, half inch little bead, you know those little ball bearing ball beads, bearing, yeah. it would take a lot for me to just grab that little bead there. So it is important to have a good match set uh, between the two. Mm -hmm. It will keep the inertia ratio. Ideally, is you know one to one. Yeah, yeah. but that's that, that may not be reality for most people. I yeah. think, but yeah, that's you're right. Question comes in: How is the uh, what is the biggest inertia ratio that we recommend? For a DD, a direct drive motor. Yeah, we didn't even talk about direct drive, did we? No, but we'll have to talk offline. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, we got one here. So, uh, okay, plans for a ro any plans for a rotary application webinar? That it's would be one, one that we can touch on. Next. We can definitely, uh, we can definitely fulfill that. I think mm -hmm. that would be a good one we can move on forward with. How do we solve jerk problem using servo? Ah, so that's the uh, so actually in the sizing software I didn't show this, mm -hmm. but there is a way you could use the jerk feature to have S curve. So rather than having uh, a command that goes, you know, straight balls to the wall as the highest uh, on the acceleration rate, you can do a, a what's called a, an S curve to 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 be able to. What am I trying to say? Um, handle kind of, the mechanics. Yeah. So you're not so harsh on the mechanics. Right. You can do an S curve for the acceleration as well as the deceleration, and that would help out as well on that. What is the main factor if I would like to optimize in regards to the cost of the motor? Is it just a matter of safety factor? Uh, yes, yeah, because the safety factor is kind of just looking at the you know, what the motor has in the columns. I'm assuming that's what this means. If not, mm -hmm. I apologize. But in the columns, what does the rated, uh, what is the rated torque of the motor compared to what does the application really call for? That's what the factor of safety is saying. Like I have, I have 140% more motor available to use. So you can you can use this motor for forever if you wanted to. Um, versus if you don't have enough, you'll see the, the green change to red because there is not enough torque or speed at the motor level to handle the application. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Uh, this would be more of a, I guess, a commercial. I mean, a sales question, yeah, yeah. One is a, so the question so the, is, I've got multiple motors that will fit the bill. Um, how do I choose? I mean, if it's me, I've got multiple motors that fit. I'm going to look to see which ones I can get the fastest and which ones I can get at the lowest price. So commercially, you know, you want to look at stock. Maybe you know what, mm -hmm. what's it, what's in stock that I can get. Because chances are, maybe you want to do not just this one motor, but you want a couple machines that are coming down the line. So you want to make sure the stock's in hand. You want to talk about stock? I don't, I don't know if we're yeah. So so here. typically speaking, we we stock everything in Chicago. Uh, so anything you can find. There are a few variants here and there that will have a little bit longer lead times, but our by and large, we, we we stock everything in Chicago um, at our at our U.S. headquarters. Something else worth mentioning there too: How do I choose between multiples? I might look at my entire facility and say, "Okay, how many of these machines am I going to have? They're going to be just like this one versus how many of these machines am I going to have? They're going to be like something else." And then decide based off of spare parts which one, which which motor might be the one that I end up using or consuming more for more projects. Then that way you're you're reducing your overall spare car spare parts cost. That's uh again. That's kind of up to you on that. Awesome job, guys. Love it. Servo Looney Tunes. What do you think she was talking about Somebody that? Somebody didn't seem to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In a vertical uh, ball screw application, is it uh, safe to assume that since the servo motor is used to hold, that a brake is uh, not required? Yeah, I'll answer that one. If it's vertical, you need to go ahead and plan on using a servo brake for that because when you... When you turn off power, when you cut power to that servo, um, you're going to want to have a brake that'll just hold it. <clears throat> In this case, our brakes are 24 volt brakes. You apply 24 volt power to them, and it releases the the braking. So now, even if you even if you shut off power, you'll still have 
you'll still have braking, you'll still be able to hold that load? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. That was another, I, I would say that was mistake number four, maybe is assuming that, a, that as long as you have the torque that you don't need a brake, but what happens when you turn off the, the whole system and cut power, then all of a sudden you've got nothing holding that. Well, typically the load. brakes are going to be fail safe, so they come on. Assuming yeah. you have a brake, right? Assuming you have a brake. Let's, right. say, you, let's right. say you didn't. Let's say you, didn't, you didn't buy a brake yeah. or didn't buy a motor with a brake. Yeah. Yeah. Bad. Bad news. Bad news bears. Uh, question: Does a higher peak torque imply a higher allowed RMS torque? I think uh, they tend to go. They they tend to go. Uh, they're purport, not proportionally, but if you have a higher peak torque, then I would argue that your RMS torque is going to be higher as well because the math is what we say it's three. The, our peak torque ratings are always three and a half times our RMS ratings. Yes, but it's important to also note that uh, depending on the series of the motor, there is a rated right. speed and a rated torque. So there's always a knee. Like there's, it's not going to yeah, be. Yeah, you can't yeah, shift you're right, you're So right. there's always going to be a knee. Typically on uh, on like on the J motors, these run rated speed at 3,000 RPM. Uh, rated and then 6,000 RPM is the peak, the, the max it can go. Uh, at that 3,000 RPM speed, you have a set amount of torque that you that you've got. You can always dip into the peak speed, but you your RMS wants to stay in that RMS region, and you can do that all day every day if you wanted to. Good question. I think that about about answers all the questions, guys and gals. Whoever was on, whoever was on the call, mm -hmm. we really appreciate the time that you've taken to uh, to be here with us. Uh, if you um, like the survey, like we, or like this uh, webinar, please. Uh, we've seen some of the questions in the chat and so forth, so we'll plan for some more in the future. Uh, yeah. Until then, I'm um, Michael Petrini, and I'm Sixto Morales. Our contact information is uh, is here if you want to reach out to us, and we thank you again. Thank you.